Good morning, friends. Welcome once again to the CEC Edison live lecture. Uh, dear friends, in this session today, we would be discussing on gender mainstreaming of uh, higher education. And uh, under this very topic, uh, we would be discussing on management education and how to teach uh, women's studies as well as the various other aspects on for this, we have again with us in our studios, uh, Dr. Shashila Kaushik. Dr. Kaushik is retired professor from Department of uh, Political Science, uh, Delhi University, as well as uh, uh, she is former director of uh, Women's Studies Center. So, taking advantages from her experience, let understand about the topic, gender mainstreaming of higher education. So, first of all, I would like to welcome our guest, Dr. Shashila Kaushik. Hello, ma'am. Welcome to the Edisit Lecture. Uh, as uh, we are going to discuss various aspects under this very topic so I would like you to introduce the topic first and then we can move forward I'll do that <laughs> as Geetika requires me to do um, actually we have been doing quite a few lectures in the past on what is women's studies and various components of women's studies approach of women's studies uh, you know, almost like an isolated subject as such insulated from other subjects which we have been uh, teaching or learning in our colleges and the universities. This time I thought what we'll do is how to connect women's studies to other studies which anyway the students have to be doing in, all, in their mainstream disciplines. That's why I'm calling this as gender mainstreaming in higher education. Higher education is all various faculties and various subjects, science, arts, humanities, technical, legal, many other faculties. And women's studies is something which is common to all of them. But at the same time, in the universities, the practice has been one of teaching women's studies as a separate subject. And uh, uh, we also believe in a way that it is as good or as uh, any other subject. So we also have introduced in various uh, colleges and universities a BA or an MA in or a certificate course or something like that in women's studies. In fact, of late, this particular academic year, even at the plus two stage, uh, the gender studies has been introduced as an option paper as a separate course in our uh, class 11 and class 12, which is a very welcome development so that it sort of makes the students understand because they are the age group of 16 to 19. So understand what is, is it by way of a gender studies. But even while we do all this, what we are finding is uh, there is a sort of an exclusiveness among the various subjects. That's why we call it as uh, academic uh, exclusiveness, uh, where we are now dealing with a division among the disciplines. We think we not merely divide the disciplines into various faculties, but even within the faculties, we again have different subjects. But of late, we do believe the approach has to be one of interdisciplinary because when you teach economics, definitely you have some amount of public policy coming in. When you teach political science, you have some amount of economics coming in, so we have a political economy. When you do history, we find sociology has a lot to do with history. And when you do sociology, we know the historical social context of various issues. So you do find the various subjects really are interrelated and so you want uh, some way, some connections to be established among the various disciplines. So this sort of an academic exclusiveness of various disciplines being separate from each other need to be in a way uh, bridged in the course of then our studies or our approach or our uh, formulating syllabi things like this so that any person who passes out of any degree any subject has a certain amount of basic information and knowledge about the other subjects which enables them at a later stage in their career uh, to sort of understand things better in a holistic context that's why this divide among the disciplines and the academic exclusiveness is something which we need to sort of bridge over 
And so we want to have an approach of interdisciplinary courses. Courses which involves various subjects, various themes and various approaches in studying any particular subject. So this interdisciplinary courses need to be in turn identified, defined before we go into making any studies or syllabi about them. Very often I also find when we say interdisciplinary courses, again once again what they do, if you have about in a BA about 8 subjects to study in a, any course, one of the subjects, one of the papers, one of the courses will be women's studies. The rest 7 would be on something else which pertains to the mainstream discipline. So once again, even within the courses we find uh, women's studies is separated from the others as a separate course sometimes compulsory as a part of the eight courses, sometimes you even find them uh, sort of optional. So women's studies becomes optional, then people do not do it. So we, we do not like that to be called as an interdisciplinary course, that is something which you do optionally, something you do compulsorily, but we move further to see how uh, women's studies gets involved integrated and becomes part of any topic, any research, any subject you teach or study. So every topic we may have may lend itself to involving the theme of women's studies and women's issues because after all women, start, women are part of the society. So any social science or even pure sciences, any social science or pure sciences or sciences like biology and botany and many other things have definite implications for women and the implica women's issues definitely have implications for them. So whatever is the theme we are discussing, whether there could be a sort of a gender input into it, a gender perspective on it and which could become inalienable part of that particular theme. This is an attempt we have to make if really we bring women's stu women studies into all and if we really call ourselves as an interdisciplinary courses. So it also means that uh, it is a question of reaction because many things when we begin putting a woman into it looks very different, take you to different uh, theories and take you to different conclusions and different outcome of it, consequences are different. So there is a certain amount of action and reaction involved in it. So the mainstream disciplines, whichever it is, history or political science or anything else, will go through a certain amount of change as a way of interacting with the input which is coming from the women's studies. For instance, if I take a subject like in political science, the freedom movement. Freedom movement is something which all of us are studying almost from the time we are five, fifth class or onwards or even earlier. We have studied about the various leadership in freedom movement. We talked about various leaders in freedom movement who led the national movement in India. Often I, I used to find the women leaders were missing in that. We do have great leaders like Sarojini Naidu who were even president of the Congress. Annie Besant, president of the Indian National Congress. But what was their role, what was their uh, theories, what, how did they approach anything, Is was there any special issue which Sarojini Naidu or Annie Besant focused on? These things do not figure in our freedom struggle studies. So if you are going to study in the, uh, uh, Annie Besant, then you begin studying her contribution to women's education how they started a whole lot of schools and education for girls in India because they found women are not participating too much in freedom struggle and they are not uh, exposed to the freedom struggle of India. Then the same way when Sarojini Naidu became the president of the Indian National Congress, the issue she focused on was right to vote, right to vote equally for women in this country. So when she went and assumed the post of a president of the Indian National Congress, she took two women along with her who were big leaders and either of them sat on her side and she introduced women's issues into the Indian National Congress. So you find in the 1930s under the freedom struggles auspices because of their leadership, in the, the education of women 
spread far and wide in India. The educational graph of the girl children and women went up. Lot more other social reform issues came up like a dowry issue and many other issues concerning women. And we also for the first time talked in terms of the suffragette, the right to vote, right to franchise for women in this country. Though finally we won it after India became independent and when you had the Republican Constitution of India where we have the equal right to vote for women in this country, still the necessary historical background and evolution had been laid down from almost 1929 when Sarojini Naidu became the president of the Indian National Congress. Now these things are missing from our history books. Uh, that's where when we study in terms of history and then we introduce some of these elements of women's studies or women's issues into them, then we also begin finding out how the Indian national movement changed, how when we adopted the constitution, we talked in terms of the personal laws, we talked in terms of the fundamental rights which gave us equal right equality of sexes, talked in terms of directive principles of state policy, which talks in terms of uniform civil code and um, doing good by the women and children in this country and many other things. So it is not that the fundamental rights and directive principles came all of a sudden. It came because of the historical movement we had, Indian National Congress movement. And it came in the by way of Indian Freedom Movement because we had leaders like Sarojin Naidu and uh, Annie Besant and many others who pushed it into the uh, Congress manifestos, Congress discussions. So this is precisely where when we study these subjects, only an example which I am giving, this is where we want to do it as a part, integral part of the main codes of history main studies on freedom movement of India rather than merely as a women's studies course which talks about the role of women in history or the role of women in Indian national movement which is also important so that we can do it in greater details there uh, but then the both have to be approached. So even when we have a specialized course in women's studies we also must put it as a part of our main course in this and in an integral form, not keep it only as a separate subject or a separate study or a separate course, but put them in as a part of the main one. Um, so this is precisely where I am talking in terms of the women's studies as an approach, talking in terms of we mainstreaming the women's studies. That's the career word which we are now using more and more rather than the curriculum development in women's studies as such. Curriculum development is a broader word which means many more things than just mainstreaming this. Now I thought in this for instance, I'll uh, take up for example, though I gave you an example from history and political science, but mainly I thought we will take up as example the professional and management courses to study with. For the simple reason that uh, we find not merely men but also more and more women are now getting into uh, such professional courses. There is a greater number of girls who are getting into professional and management courses these days than it was before, maybe about 10 years before. We also believe not merely women but also the male students and the male faculty also should be able to study and teach the women's studies courses, women's studies themes, women's studies ideologies and theories in the professional and management courses because it helps the students at a later stage when they get into a job to focus and reflect on the women who are part of the community or the work which they are doing or their target groups as such. Uh, so that is where while we specialize on women's studies, even within these professional courses we can introduce women's studies courses. If it is a law, we can say women and law. If it is management, we can say women in management or women's issues and management uh, development. We can also talk about it in engineering, architecture. These are all various professional courses these days which are coming up in which more and more men and women are participating and more and more men and women are graduating and getting into specialized jobs as either engineers or lawyers or judges or management experts 
whatever you may think in terms of for joining the companies, particularly multinationals and big national companies, where there were exclusive attention even to the women as managers, women as employees in their organization. So, in order to prepare them for facing these issues and becoming good managers, good lawyers, good engineers, we need to also introduce them to the women's studies issue at a lay earlier stage, which means in the educate at the educational level, in the educational flyby are where we come into the thing. So, once again, a gender mainstreaming in professional and management courses becomes uh, extremely important. And at the same time, we also have a women's studies course. We, for instance, have in IITs and uh, many colleges a study course either called women's studies. They even have a women's studies development center in many of the private management and public management universities and colleges, which helps them to understand the women's issues and then bring it into the mainstream discipline, hold workshops, seminars, prepare material and display things, celebrate important women's day functions. For that, you require also an exclusive approach. So, it is a combination of a specialization and exclusiveness which we are talking of when we do the women's studies as such. Uh, but very often, we also have people who are telling us, oh, we have no distinction between men and women. We do not teach women's issues that we are, and we do not teach men's issues. If you teach women's studies, we also need to teach men's studies. Something like that, you have arguments which keep coming up. Oh, is there a men's studies to teach? No. We do general studies. There is no women or men distinction there. We do general studies. But and what it means is in a general study, you become oblivious of the gender issues. In a general studies, you often find gender issues do not come up. So, they are not really neutral between men and women, they are really oblivious of the gender issues, which means they do not pay attention or they do not know about it, they are ignorant about it, they do not feel the need for it to introduce any gender issues, that does not make them gender neutral. Because what becomes is, if you become gender oblivious or do not include gender, then you automatically end up in a society like ours uh, into gender biased. So, that is why there is nothing called gender neutral, it becomes gender biased. Whether you want to do it that way, whether you understand it that way, it is not a deliberate effort to be gender biased. But when you do not put a gender issues there, you automatically become gender biased. And gender bias means you obviously are anti-women, un unfriendly to women's issues, unfriendly to women as a target group when you come out of your syllabi. So, this is where we are now emphasizing almost um, all important agencies dealing with women's studies and women's issues in a, are talking in terms of mainstreaming the women's studies and not keeping it exclusive as a privilege only of the women's studies centers or women's studies scholars or women's studies experts, though we still need all of them. We still need the center, we still need the experts, we still need uh, curriculum, we still need literature, data research on women, even to focus on women, even to bring the knowledge into the wider stream, you still need all of them. But they need to be the results, the data, the research which you produce have to come to other mainstream disciplines so that they can benefit out of this. Uh, that is why the traditional approach has been specialize, develop the, and then propagate, do research do data collection, do teaching, do community action, but all of this on women as a separate category. So, when you do specialize on women's studies, you only do anything and everything about women, you do not do anything about gender. See, you cannot do women's issues or women in politics unless you also understand politics. You cannot do women's issues in economics unless you also understand the general economics, their theories, their methodologies, their approach, their conclusion. You have to go through their data, but you still will have to do also. So, you specialize on women's studies, develop women's studies in economics or political science or history and then lobby for it. 
because propagate means you really lobby for it. How do we lobby for it? Through research. We don't lobby for it in uh, something like going on the streets and doing it, but we can do it through our research. If you mo focus more and more on research on women, we will bring out a lot of literature as well as a lot of data. So collect the data and then show it to them. Look, when India is improving and developing so much under globalization, so much work is created, but then you find the work of women is going behind less than what even was before. This you can, and thereby very many women are now getting out of the workforce. Participation rate is coming down or they want to get more and more into a service sector and not so much in the productive sector or in the research and production sector as much as or in the service sector. Not in the managerial level but more and more under the lower four, class 3, class 4, uh, computer receptionist, computer operators. This level we have a glut of women. Well, when we go up to the managerial level, this is narrowing down on the top, what you call a pipeline theory in management. So this is proved by what? This is proved and confirmed by the data collection. It is the data which tells us there is a glut at the lower level, there is very little at the top level that more women have come out of jobs mainly because of the globalization. Even when India is showing a growth rate, still we find the women in jobs is coming down. So this sort of um, conclusions we can arrive at only on the base of data. So data collection becomes extremely important to us in India and there is a big gap in the data collection. So in the past 20 years, we, the government also is doing it and other educational agencies are also asking for a segregated data on women and men. Just a general data, whether India is growing up, growing down, so many people participated in the election, things like that, does not satisfy us anymore. If people participated in the elections and it's going up in the recent elections, our participation has been very high. We would also like to know how many women participated, how many men participated. What's a women and the men turnout? Then we compare the women with the men and say that less women are going for voting. Why? Or we say from the previous elections, women, more women are participating now, good, which means they are exposed to democracy and they are participating in their, the political action of voting and so they will emerge tomorrow as a vote bank so that their issues will be listened to by the political authorities, the lawmakers and the policy makers. So for all these, we need a data. So that is where the gender segregated data is coming up. Same thing is about teaching and same thing about community action. So in community action very often we are also focusing on women, women on law, their knowledge about law, their awareness about issues, uh, their education level and uh, health. Many other things also we are taking up in a community action with a specialization on the women as our target group. I'm finding it in the high schools is being done, it's done in the colleges as the NSS activity, even our NCC has a community action wing, so they are also doing there for the women. So with the result in all our various activities, teaching, research, training, uh, community action, data collection, in all these things we are finding a specialized. But then this is a traditional method. This is a method which is traditional because now it's about 20, 25 years old. We have been doing all this or even more. We have been doing all this with a specialization and a focus on women as such. Now whatever we are collecting there as information needs to be or as research or as data needs to be now combined. They cannot exist separately. They have to be combined with the general data collection, general things so that in the general mainstream discipline, our conclusions and uh, knowledge output will be little more wholesome, holistic and then they will also include women as part of their target group and the issues will come up. The minute you make it a part of your general economics, general political science, issues concerning women also can be taken up. That's why we have now changed, to give an example, we have changed the way, whole way of a census collection. 
in the past two census collection at least 2011 and 2001 there's a lot of difference in the approaches in which we collect the data in the census we have heads of the household introduced now and we keep the possibility that women also could be heads of the household previously it was not there women's work we never asked women what work they do we when they say we don't do any work when the housewives say that we don't do any work we believe that they don't do any work we because there is no earning from the work which they do so immediately we think there is no employment there is no work women are all sitting at home this is a very wrong conclusion so we have made change the method to have a chart a daytime chart from morning till evening what will women be doing how much of it is economic productivity and every how much of it could have been can be still computed into our value economic value so we have daily profile of women what they do all the all types of women are being studied in the census and many more things have come up in the census methodology collecting data and their approach to analyze them so this is possible because the data which were collected in women studies has been now pushed into as an input into the census studies so the census is changing itself its methodology and its conclusion and as a benefit whatever the census is producing or nss survey is producing it goes back into our research into our data collection so that helps our teaching that helps our research so this is where the collusion and the mixing and the combining becomes extremely useful to both ways both to the disciplines as well as to women studies and to the women at large um, so the current view is one of mix mingle and amalgamate it is not enough if you just mix them somewhere women exist somewhere men exist and nothing happens now you join them up integrate them mingle them when you mingle them you get answers which is an amalgamated answer which you will get like in a chemistry or something like this it won't be just an into when two or three elements go into an equation ultimately what you get is a combined product in chemistry the same way you will get a combined product as a result of your this combination and mixing and then you also simultaneously have women studies its approach its perspective and its data then you try that i said before propagate or influence or lobby and change thereby the knowledge and globalize the knowledge which means make it wholesome make it holistic globalize doesn't mean only the globe country regions or anything but even within your own country whatever is the knowledge you have is not isolated but get interactive when you interactive it moves in a cycle so we call it as a globalizing of knowledge and thereby making the relevance of mainstream disciplines not merely women studies relevance but also main themes disciplines more and more relevant to all sections of the population all age groups of the population all policy makers and others of the of the country and make their mainstream disciplines or the policy making also an inclusive process where it includes women and children where it includes women of all ages and the children where it includes the old women these days a lot of studies are being done on old age and a lot of data is being collected about older women which in turn also now uh, goes into our demography as well as health policy and many other things in this country so how will be the result and what will be the net outcome of it definitely the net outcome of it will be very many very much more beneficial to the country to the students to the knowledge output and ultimately perhaps to gender sensitize the mainstream disciplines as such so our mainstream disciplines no longer will be exclusive no longer will be male oriented because what you do not put gender mainstreaming there as i said before it is not gender neutral what happens is the traditional view subsumes the women or uh, mainly what happens outside is what you think general but actually it's male data male dominated male ideology male beneficial and uh, women women get subsumed that is under that 
but subsumed means really not a positive one, but subsumed really means suppressive one. You really suppress women's issues, you suppress women's knowledge, you suppress data about women, you suppress issues about women, you suppress policies of our women focusing on that. So it becomes more male oriented, male centric, not any fault of the male, but mainly because the women's issues are not thrown open, and brought to the surface and treated equally. And this happens at the development policy also. For instance, I will give you an example again, our educational policy. Very fond of this example. We worked out a lot of policies for bringing more and more uh, people into education, especially in the rural side of India, especially in the age group of zero, 06 to onwards, when they should be going to primary classes and all. And we also found then little later when the data collect came up that more girls are not going and whatever little data we have our kids going, they are mostly by males, that is the boys. So we began approaching the girls education. We focused more and more on the development of girls education. Then we thought of many things. We thought of for instance having a school close by believing the girls are not going to schools after they become 12 or so when they come of age, believing that our conservatism and religiosity is stopping the girls from going to school. So we brought women teachers into our schools rather than having a combination of male and women teachers there. We deprived the males of a job in the villages as one of the, this was one of the grievances that more women are getting teachers job, they are not going to get. So our policies began breeding in a lot of contradictions and still we did failed in getting more girls to school. Then one of the studies which was done with the government help here in All India study pointed out the main reason why the girls are not going to school after they are 8 or so is not all the socio-cultural region, uh, reasons alone, they are all there, I am not saying that. But the socio-cultural religious reasons are one, but more importantly the work which the young girls do in the house either by way of domestic chores or by way of helping out with the household occupation. Many girls are involved in agricultural operations when the mother and the father goes to the field or something, the girls are looking after the family. They are good looking after the younger children, siblings. They are even cooking or washing the vessels at home. Or they even carry a lot of food and other items to the field to give it to the mother and the father. So these are all economic activities. Without the girl performing it, it will, those economic activities cannot be done. But the thing is, they are domestic chores. We call them domestic chores. You ask the mothers, they will say, if they don't do it, how will I go to the field and work? Or how do I do any other occupation? So they become substitute to the mothers in the house. The main reason we found was domestic chores and looking after the younger siblings, out of it the most important thing, even if the mother cooks in the morning and does everything and then goes, you still need a person in the house to look after the younger ones at home. So this never, never got into our policy inputs. This perspective never came into our educational policies. It's only when the women's studies pointed this out more and more, then our educational policy talked in terms of it. So you have a national education policy of 1986 talking about early child care, early childhood education. So that you make provision for the small kids and small infants to be taken care of so that these girls can go to school and spend 3-4 hours in the school. So this sort of, and I won't get into the details of it, but this sort of an um, outlook came up, when the approach came up only when we knew this data collection from the women's study centers. So it has the traditional view has been always not focusing on women, but it's a subsequent one's approaches which has brought these things into the thing. So a similar thing we can talk in terms at a higher level uh, by choosing one of the various professional courses. Because whatever I was talking now are examples from our mainstream traditional courses like history, political science, economics, etc., etc., sociology. But these days more and more men and women male and female students are going into management studies. More and more of them are getting into jobs. More and more of issues are coming up in the management. 
so we need to see how women studies can get into the management studies and more sort of influence them to deal with women studies issues. I also find um, from the women studies point of view too, one of the most important um, targets we think of in women studies is empowerment of women. We talk in terms of empowerment of women. Uh, empowerment of women, especially in the political sphere, is often talked about, where we talk of women getting more and more into the decision making process. It is not employment alone, but if you get employment more and more at the lower levels in jobs, then you do not have the power to make any decisions. That make does not talk about your strength and empowerment. But when you go into higher levels of uh, employment with whatever may be the public sector, private sector, educational sector or manufacturing sector, whatever we are talking in terms of, if women get more and more to higher levels, then they get into a certain amount of power, power under decision making positions and processes. That gives an empowerment to the women and through that empowerment you can also empower other women in the society. So management is one which gives this sort of an empowerment to women. So we are focusing these days more and more, even UGC is focusing more and more on the how to bring more women into management. If we have to bring more women into management, we have to have more women in management education and training. We also have to have more of women studies in management training and management education so that we understand the management issues, uh, we help in uh, solving a lot of problems of management and we bring more women at the higher level of management. That is why I am taking it up as, uh, as an example for ourselves, let us do with this management because now we have colleges which talk about BBM courses. MBM, MBA courses and we have very many management institutes which are coming up in the country both in the public as well as in the private sector and new areas of management are coming up not merely only industrial management but we even have other types of management which is coming up now hotel management, tourism management, many other man hospital management. So everywhere we have got a huge amount of management studies institutions and courses which are coming up. So if you can get into the management courses, then I think women studies will do a wonderful job in creating more and more empowered women, women in policy making, women in decision making. So we get more of good correct policies which encourage more women to come up into employment and job and do the work properly. So when you talk in terms of management studies, then one of the major theme in management studies is the human uh, resources management. Because that is where we deal with uh, recruitment, promotion, uh, motivating the women to come in as well as stay on and then move up in the uh, positions. Because we also have this problem. Uh, in management too, the number of women who have gone into either by way of education or by way of job later is less than that of the men. We still do not have the 50-50 proportion. So what are the problems there? If they get into a job, why is it a majority of women in a triangular pyramidical form, majority of women are still staying at the lower level and only a very few percentage of women go up to the top. Even in our educational level, very few women become vice chancellor, registrar, controller, department heads. Most of them are remain till the end of their career as lecturers in a college as such, which is not bad. But the question is they are not moving up, they are not getting the promotion. Why? And we also have the issue of many people not adding up to their own qualifications and their training and skills and other things so that they can move up the ladder. So there is no motivation as such. The third problem we have here is a certain amount of dropout. The dropout from jobs whether in the educational or other sphere is quite heavy in the case of women. Many of these uh, dropout takes place not because the women are uh, unhappy with the job or they don't want tired of the job, but also because of other considerations which are very much uh, issues in women's studies, domestic care, professional and personal um, conflicts, role conflicts, age, child, child breeding, 
child, child birth, child breeding, child care until almost they are 18 looking after not merely their health and food but also their education. The ambitions of the children become the ambitions of the mother. So on the transfer of the husband to another place, many of the, or looking after the age old parents and parents-in-law, many of these fears which have to be shared between both men and women in a family often becomes only the sole burden of um, the mother, the women, the young uh, mothers or the young women in the family. The result is they find it very difficult to cope up with both the public and the private. Uh, work which they have to do. So often they give up the public work, that is the job, and they become more and more attuned to the uh, house because there's no substitution in the house. The family work has to go on. It cannot be given up. And there's no substitution there, how much you may get a maid or somebody. Still, uh, it remains as the responsibility of the housewife. So many of them choose to give up the job or when the husband gets transferred, the family cannot divide itself. So they choose to give up their job and move along with the husband to another place. You still find these sort of patriarchal institutions, forces, processes are functioning very strongly in our society that ultimately is the women who yield place. Uh, when, so she is not motivated. So she doesn't think in terms of job as a career, but job only as a hobby, as long as possible. This act, this motivate, this means a lack of motivation, uh, a way of promoting herself, her own skill, and become qualified for higher thing. So you find a lot of women are not doing PhDs, not public publishing anything. Uh, writing articles or participating in workshops or attending even the workshops uh, because that promotes their knowledge and that will lead to a higher uh, grade in their own uh, jobs. But very many lecturers then remain to be lecturers if till the time they carry on. Uh, so these are issues of human resource management for a company, for a firm, for even a university, for agencies because recruitment, promotion, motivation, drop out, these are all things which the companies and the, and the management in any place will have to worry about. The second is discipline. When you, uh, when you are more and more women in um, your jobs than before, it does breed in a certain amount of issues of discipline. And even keeping the women on the job, asking them to correct, come on correct time and go back uh, only when the work is over, making them sit up till 9 o'clock in the night because you have to get many things done. Uh, often looks like a discipline issue. It's not a discipline issue, but the people management often treats it like a discipline issue. Oh, this woman comes late, this woman goes uh, very early, so she's not a disciplined person in my staff. No, we need to think about why she comes late, why she goes early, what are the social constraints she has, and how to remove it. All these things have become a concern, should become a concern for the management of all these institutions. Again, when you give the training, we also have come across whenever you give a training, the number of women who participate in the in-house training or in-service training, uh, the women are less, the men are more. When you have a training outside your organization, you have to send them to outside cities or something, organization, or when they have to go abroad, uh, the men opt in even before the women could and the women hesitate because they have to think of many other considerations before they can give their name for training. So they remained as untrained. And the management doesn't worry about it. Okay, we have to have this much number. The men are prepared to go. They will come back and join the thing. That will be more useful to us. The women are not reliable. First, they will not go. After coming back, they may not stick to us. They may change. They may move along with their husbands. The children come up. They will uh, give up. So this sort of uh, thinking, which I call it as a patriarchal mindset, is still very strong among our management. So human resource management has to sort of find ways, re-change itself and re-socialize itself and then do this fresh thinking on the women in their manage, in their jobs. And when it comes to social interaction, there's another issue, negotiation. We find women are not being sent anywhere when it comes to negotiation, deals making or many other things because they think women are not skilled there. 
uh, very many companies have to arrive at business uh, negotiations, business agreements and go out, go and meet people, maybe sometimes even meet in the later hours in the day when others are free. So this sort of social interaction and negotiations they find women cannot do. And the women also very often avoid these things. They don't want to go about meeting people whom they don't know or where it may involve other types of negotiations which they don't want to do. And so they opt out of it and so they remain excluded from this. Their public exposure is less, so their skills are less, their training is less, so their opportunities are also less in their thing. So the promotion going up on the managerial level also gets constrained. So, but when we do all this then, then we have to sit and understand this. It is not enough just to point out the gaps. It is not just enough to say women are not eligible for this. It is not just to say women will do only like this. It is not enough to say that women have a mindset which is very, very sub submissive, suppressive. They don't opt out. They are not volunteers. They don't want to take risks, uh, things like this. That is one way of doing, analyzing it. But that is not a right way of analyzing it. But we must begin seeing why the women have these problems, why the women are opting out, why the women cannot do this, why the women have not gone for training, uh, why every time when you offer a post to them at a managerial level or in the universities I have heard this very often, when they appoint you to a committee or the chairman of a chairperson of a committee, many important senior women say, no sir, I do not want to do this. It will mean late in the evening, my children will be waiting, they have to appear for class 12 exam, they are appearing for exams, I have to go back. As if the home functions are totally only their headache and not that of others in the family, you can also share. So sometimes it is also insecurity within the family, insecurity in transport, commuting, uh, women have no property, so often they don't have a car, so these days I find all of them have a mobility, even then they still opt out of it, late in the evenings I can't go back sort of stuff. So any committee chairmanship or any committee membership may require you to stay back beyond the office hours which you don't want to do, so you opt out of a lot of them. So this can be rectified, it needs to be rectified, One, how do we do it? find, understand what are the problems, find and understand the lives of women, find and understand how the duties women have, find out why the duties have been imposed on them and who has imposed on them. And so an understanding of the social life of women needs to be there, understanding of the patriarchal nature of our society has to be there and understanding has to be there which why that why what women do in today's context or jobs which are uh, have to be done if they are inevitable somebody or other has to do it otherwise your family structure will collapse your educational structure will collapse your girl children will not come up in your education things or even boys there may be other side effects of it so how exactly we do it will require a tremendous understanding of women's studies its conclusions and its theories and its its um, as a tool of social engineering and so as tool of social analysis. Uh, we should treat women's studies as an applied science, not merely as a hobby course or only something which I want to do as an add-on course and just know a little bit about women and be like that, but treat it as a science because it has its own theories, it has its own methodology and it arrives at its own logical, rational conclusions which are universal. So this is the qualification for a science that its theories and its conclusions, its methodology should be universal. We know the situation of women all over India, the world are more or less the same, the management attitude is more or less the same, the participation of women in management and other spheres is exactly the same all over the world whether it is a developed country or a developing country. So we must treat it as an applied science or not merely as a social work course or just a social work to undertake. Um, and in, when we do that, of course we will know the theories of patriarchy very well and we will understand the gender inequality, deep inequality in the society and we must bring it into our content and teaching of 
professional education, I am not even taking only the women's education, but the professional education as such. So that every professional education as I said whether it is law or medical or engineering or architecture or uh, of course management, uh, we definitely have this women's studies content put into that everywhere so that they are able at relevant conclusions, relevant methodologies in their own subject. Um, so we want more women in management, we want less of gender imbalance in management because we find uh, there is a tremendous amount of imbalance in the offices. There will be 2 women and 10 men and the 2 women will become the object of attraction for the 10 men, men or object of distraction for those 2 10 men and so the management does not want to have the women saying they are all distracting. Let us have an equal balance let us have the more or less equal number so that this distraction and anything else which management is worried about will not take place. So it is not a fault of the women, it is the fault of the management not to have a gender balance or a gender parity in their offices, it is an issue for the management to worry about. You then go about asking then you find there is a lack of experience and trained women available. A vice chancellor wants to put more and more women into the various committees of managing the university. But then he found not many women are professors, not many women are in senior level, not many women have had a lot of ex administrative experience. Why? Because most of the women are at the lower levels and they have never been promoted to become either an associate professor or a professor. So they do not have that sort of exposure and experience. So train the women make them available in large amount in a mass critical number, then you can choose out of them those whom you want for your power positions. And stop the dropout from education work, which means how do you do it? You find the reasons as to why the women are uh, coming out of jobs, why the women are not opting for uh, continuing with their career, why is at a certain stage you have a lot of dropout and then whomsoever you have maybe they continue till the end many of us have not dropped out sustained ourselves in the job under varied types of challenges that is why some day we could become a professor some day we could get into the committees and maybe we can even hope even uh, though we may not get the posts of a registrar or um, dean or uh, vice chancellor even in our universities because we still have only about 3 percent of the vice chancellors in about 500 universities of India as women. So the dropout has to be stopped. If you do not have the dropout or stopped at the lecturer stage you cannot have professors. If you do not have professors you cannot have them at the management level. The same is true about many of the other many of the women opt out to work from home home based work. Many of them op opt out of regular jobs, 10 to 5 jobs or whatever they call regular jobs. The result is they can never become vice president of a company. They will be doing consultancy perhaps, they will be working from home, they will be taking flexible timing, but they will never become the presidents, vice presidents, senior executives, CEOs of the companies as such. So if you drop out has to be stopped somehow and the management education should find out how exactly we can stop this drop out and the management of the companies should also devise ways and means how the women whom they have employed, the women whom they have trained, the women who are experienced over a year do not drop out because it is they are the ones who lose. They put so much of cost into it but then they do lose on the human resources of these experienced women. So with the result I think it should become one of the important aims of the management in any company to find ways and means of retaining the women and uh, improving their skills, giving them the opportunities, allowing them to move up so that you as well as the women, the company as well as the women benefit from their own talents, hidden talents, sometimes not coming out at all and whatever talents they have that should be utilized properly so that the company does not lose out on the women's potentials and the talents as such. The most important issues which are coming up now in before the management of any company concerning the women. Uh, which are sometimes leads to dropout, sometimes leads to headache, 
sometimes even le leads to the company paying a huge amount of money to settle the issues. We have the issues of Infosys, we had the issue of Penguin, we had many other companies internationally who had to cough out a lot of money because of not paying attention to this gender balance and gender parity. Uh, gender balance is definitely a very important way of dealing with the sexual harassment issue in the offices. But the sexual harassment issue, uh, I don't know whether the issue is new, I have a feeling the issue is old, it has been there for a very long time. But the women have become quite conscious of their being harassed. Women also have become knowledge about, uh, about how to go about it. So the issues are coming up in the open. A lot of our public sector undertakings and private companies are facing this sexual harassment issue. And we have the judicial verdict on this. So it's no longer how the companies deal with this, but of hush it under the carpet. But the judicial verdict has told you it is a compulsory uh, mandate on the companies, private, public, to have a sexual harassment committee, deal with the sexual harassment issue. They are given the ways and means of doing it. So it has become very much a legal issue, which most of the managements are now concerned about and are doing something about it. All the government departments have, public sector undertakings are having, public agencies have, and a lot of private companies are also worried about it. But how they are going about doing it is something we need to worry. And the management should put a stress on this, not dealing with that as a casual way, but uh, because it will lead to more uh, talents coming out of the women, more of their human resources coming out and benefiting the company, more of women dropping out, and the atmosphere, the environment in the office, if it's gender friendly and gender equitable, I think it adds a lot on to the productivity of the company. And finally, is a social issue, the issues of security and amenities for women. The sexual harassment does not take place only within the workplace, but it also takes place on and uh, back and forth of the workplace from home or wherever she is staying. It is in the form of transport, it is in the form of roads, it is in the form of many other issues. Now that we have a cyber issue I think come up, it also is often through the cyber resources, cyber crimes cyber sexual harassment issues which are coming up. The companies must become sensitized on this for the same reasons as I said before and see how, what they can do about it. Because even yesterday I came across a view saying how does it matter if more women do not come into the jobs. At the same time, I also came across another view. No, we must make more and more women come into the jobs. Because the, not merely it helps the women to come up, it helps the company to do better because they are losing out on many uh, values and many of the skills and talents which the women have. Women are good negotiators. Women can bring about an environment of peace and calmness in the companies. You go to meditation and you go to other types of things which companies have introduced, but if you have enough women, the atmosphere of the company, environment of the company improves. A lot of panchayat women have told us this, after they became members, the panchayat meetings are being done in a very amiable, calm, cool way, the ethos of the men have improved. And because they see women participating with them in the office at an equal level, they behave also better to women at home. So even in domestic violence and domestic peace and domestic equality have increased because men understand women are capable. Men understand women have skills. So gender parity, gender balance becomes a very important issue in the offices of the country, uh, which means the management should take more and more thing out of it more and more lessons out of it. So one aspect of it, one possibility of it is through uh, a syllabi which is engendered. Uh, a syllabi where a lot of women's issues get into, women's social life gets into, women's patriarchal restrictions get into, so that they come to understand who the woman is, what the woman is, how the society is, also the resolution of issues will come about, knowledge about laws which are sorry, there Sorry ma'am, sorry to interrupt over so, here because yeah, uh, yeah. the topic education, is Education, particularly management education should worry about them, managers should worry, get sensitized themselves. Sorry if I 
Mm. Uh, so this is, I think I'm almost talking like a missionary, but I do want it to be done. <laughs> thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much because the topic has uh, so much uh, uh, to deliver about, uh, or I could say that you have so much to give to us, uh, that is to our students with this note. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so very much for delivering such a nice lecture. And if you have any queries, you can mail us at info.cc at the rate nick.in. If you have any questions, definitely you can mail us so that the next time when Dr. Sushila Kaushik comes to our studio, we can ask your questions. Questions in the lecture itself. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you so very Thanks much. So.